a little review is in order. We've met Abraham and Sarah. They were told that they would become the parents of a great nation even though both of them were approaching their expiration date. When three strangers showed up at their tent and told them that Sarah would soon be pregnant, somewhere in her 90s, Sarah laughed. The child of her laughter was Isaac. Isaac is a rather pathetic figure in scripture. He really is little more than a bridge character, filling in the space between Abraham and Isaac's own children. When Abraham dies, it is Ishmael, not Isaac, who buries his father in the cave of Machpelah, which Abraham had purchased and in which Sarah had been buried. Isaac married Rebekah, whose name means to captivate. Evidently, she swept old Isaac right off his feet. They had a set of twin boys, Esau and Jacob. Esau was more favored by his father, Jacob more favored by his mother. Isaac's eyesight had pretty well dissolved, and it was time to pass on the birthright to the eldest of his sons. That was Esau, the firstborn. But Rebekah helped Jacob deceive his father into giving him the birthright, and then, pardon the expression, all hell broke loose. So now we're up to Jacob. Of Jacob, Presbyterian minister and writer Frederick Buechner says, twice he cheated his lame-brained brother Esau out of what was coming to him. At least once he took advantage of the old father Isaac's blindness and played him for a sucker. He outdid his double-crossing father-in-law Laban by conning him out of most of his livestock and later on, when Laban was looking the other way, by sneaking off not only with both the man's daughters, but with just about everything else that wasn't nailed down, including his household gods. Jacob wanted the moon. And if he'd ever managed to bilk heaven out of that, he would have been back the next morning for the sun and the stars to go with it. That was Jacob. Unsavory unprincipled, unscrupulous. If he were running for office today, we'd probably vote for him. When we find him in our story for the morning, Jacob is alone. He has sent his family, his slaves, and his possessions to the other side of the river Jabbok. He stands in the darkness of night. He knows that the next morning, his brother Esau will be standing where he now stands, and based on the past, that reunion will not be happy or tranquil. Jacob stands in fear of what tomorrow will bring. And then we are told that a man wrestled with him until daybreak. We are told nothing nothing about the man. There were old Canaanite myths and stories of river monsters that would rise from the misty waters and attack human beings. One commentator suggests that Jacob was wrestling with himself, with his ego, with his id, his guilt, his hubris, and self-importance. It's a little too Freudian for most Presbyterians. The great seduction that is always coming up is that we should believe that one meaning will unlock everything that is ambiguous. But whoever Jacob was wrestling had his hands full. Jacob went toe to toe, mano a mano. It was a classic draw, a divided card among the officials has any bothered to show up. The dawn was beginning to turn the night sky bright when the stranger went for the decision. The stranger hit Jacob in the hip, a below-the-belt shot, unnecessary roughness, unsportsmanlike conduct, 15 yards. 
It's nearly morning, the stranger says. Let me go. Not until you give me your blessing and tell me your name, says Jacob. All right. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Jacob pushes on. Tell me your name. To know someone's name is to have control over them. To know someone's name is to have the power to make them do what you want them to do. Why do you ask my name? The stranger has no intention of playing one of the old trickster's games. But the stranger gives Jacob his blessing, and he's gone. Who was that man? We don't know. And the story does not flat out tell us. But for Jacob's money, most of which was ill-gotten, that stranger was God. Jacob called the place Peniel, which means face, Pene of God, El. And when the sun had fully risen in the skies, we are left with the image of a battered and bruised Jacob limping off to meet his brother. That limp was with Jacob the rest of his life, the evidence of his contest at the Jabbok. Now, this is the part of the sermon where I'm supposed to tell you what that means. I'm supposed to impart some sage wisdom, some profound insight that brings all of those pieces together and packages it in a way that you can take it with you. But though it goes against my training, I'm not going to do that this morning. The notion that such a remarkable story can have only one meaning is, of course, ridiculous. When I was a little boy, I had a set of childcraft books, Google it. In one of them, there was a unit of Aesop's fables. You read the little one-page story, and then at the bottom of the page, there was the word, in italics, moral and then some pithy little saying offered to make sense of the story you had just read. These biblical stories are not little tales that have a moral at the end of them. And here's what that story means. And yet we preachers, in our exalted arrogance, deign to tell you what exactly what such a narrative means. So I'm not doing that this morning, which doesn't mean that I won't do it on another morning. But let me give you something to consider, because it's been something I have wrestled with while thinking about this story. Too often, we think of God as unapproachable, remote, withdrawn. God is up there somewhere beyond our grasp, God exists on a different plane from the rest of creation, right? Ever thought of God that way? But in this very unique and very important story, God is not like that at all. God is down in the dirt. God lays hands on human beings and grapples with them. God is less like the paintings and sculptures of Michelangelo and more like one of the characters from the WWE. And that suggests that God is not unwilling to go a few rounds with any of us. God is willing to take our questions, our doubts, our suspicions, 
God is perfectly happy to mix it up with any of us about anything, anytime, anywhere. God is more than willing and often engages us first, often initiating a little brouhaha with us. And the story that suggests that God is also not put off by whoever and whatever we are. Jacob was one of the most conniving finaglers you'll ever find. He was a cheater, a liar, and a deceiver. He stole from his father-in-law and robbed his own father. And still God took him on. God laid hands on Jacob and wrestled with him all night long. And when God realized that Jacob had nearly had the best of God, God popped him one in the hip in order to avoid being beaten by Jacob. So if you are carrying around the misguided notion that for whatever reason God is going to be put off or appalled or scandalized by your doubts and hesitations and questions, think again. If you harbor some notion that because of something you once did or something you left undone that you will somehow repulse or disgust or rebuff God, you've got another thing coming. If someone has told you the lie that you are an offense to God because of who you are and who you love, guess again. God does not reject us. God does not abandon us. God does not turn the divine back on us. Not ever. God can handle what you bring to God. God will take you on with all of your imperfections. God will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any of us and all of us. God's invitation is simply, bring it on. But fair warning, if you choose to go one-on-one -on -one with God, you will not be the same. I'm not saying that you'll walk with a limp for the rest of your life. But no one is the same having contended with God. Everyone who takes on God becomes a new creation. We are dramatically different after that experience than we were before. Wherever it happens becomes Peniel. It becomes the place, the situation, the moment when we see God's face, experience God's overpowering presence, and live to tell the tale. And that's what we're supposed to do. There is one rule about God's fight club. Tell everybody about fight club. Never be afraid to tell the story of contending with God. In the classic Ilya Kazan movie, On the Waterfront, a confrontational conversation takes place between two brothers, Charlie and Terry Malloy, played by Rod Steiger and Marlon Brando. Find me two like that on the screen today. Steiger, as Charlie Malloy says, look kid, how much you weigh, son? When you weighed 168 pounds, you were beautiful. You could have been another Billy Kahn, and that skunk we got you for a manager, he brought you along too fast. Brando, playing brother Terry Malloy, replies, it wasn't him, Charlie. It was you. Remember that night in the garden you came down to my dressing room and you said, kid, this ain't your night. We're going for the price on Wilson. You remember that? This ain't your night. 
my night. I could have taken Wilson apart. So what happens? He gets the title shot outdoors on the ballpark, and what do I get? A one-way ticket to Palookaville. You was my brother, Charlie. You should have looked out for me a bit. You should have taken care of me just a little bit so I wouldn't have to take them dives for the short end money. Charlie says, oh, I had some bets down for you. You saw some money. And then, in one of the most famous quotes in movie history, Terry Malloy says, you don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. The truth is, none of us are bums, not by a long shot. God sees all of us as contenders. And God isn't scared of any of us. Let's get ready to rumble. For now and evermore. Amen.